Let's join in prayer. Gracious and loving God, may the meditations of our hearts and the words of my lips, if they be your words, be worthy and acceptable unto you. And may your word come to your people now, either through me or despite me. Amen. Well, <clears throat> we've been looking at Jesus over the last number of weeks, and, and someone um, said to me, and you know, I'm, I'm of the opinion that, that all questions are important. Someone said to me, like, why is it important that we, s we know so much about Jesus? Isn't it just enough to know that Jesus is Jesus? And um, so I thought part of the answer might be in this song, if I can play it for you. Do we have any Bob Dylan fans in the audience? Okay, let's see if I can make this happen here. Let's join in. Let's join in prayer. Gracious and loving God, may the meditations of our hearts and the words of my lips, if they be your words, be worthy and acceptable unto you. And may your word come to your people now, either through me or despite me. Amen. Well, <clears throat> we've been looking at Jesus over the last number of weeks, and, and someone um, said to me, and you know, I'm, I'm of the opinion that, that all questions are important. Someone said to me, like, why is it important that we, s we know so much about Jesus? Isn't it just enough to know that Jesus is Jesus? And um, so I thought part of the answer might be in this song, if I can play it for you. Do we have any Bob Dylan fans in the audience? Okay, let's see if I can make this happen here.
whose side is God on? And, uh, you know, Kate asked a great question this morning. Um, what does God look like? Whose side is God on? And if we don't understand uh, the fullness of Jesus, life, birth, um, death, resurrection, and, and who he was and how he became the face of God for us, then we can't answer questions like that. Because we've been going to war for um, thousands of years, um, all of us believing that when we've gone to war, God's been on our side. And at the same time, the other side has believed that God is on theirs. And uh, Dylan's song ends, you know, with the line that uh, if God was really on our side, perhaps the next thing God could do is end the next war. So that's why we're taking all this time to create this kind of brush stroke uh, sense of who Jesus is. Can you put up the next slide for me, Deb? Yeah. So we began some weeks ago, and we, we just spent two weeks on the world in which Jesus grew up in and the culture in which he was nurtured in and recognize that if we are not able to understand a little bit about that world and go back into that world and come into the, this world to interpret Jesus, then we're going to make some mistakes. And then we looked at two pictures of Jesus. Again, we broad stroked them from two modern scholars of the uh, historical Jesus moment movement, and one was Marcus Borg. Next slide there, I think, Deb is Scott, yeah. And um, Marcus Borg, this is Marcus Borg's faith statement. And Marcus Borg uh, talks about Jesus, and he says, you know, Jesus was a charismatic, uh, spirit-filled person. And he talks about the pre-Easter Jesus and the post-Easter Jesus. And in the pre-Easter Jesus, he says Jesus was a sage, a movement initiator, um, a social prophet, and a healer. And when he was killed, um, he was killed by imperial power. In other words, he was killed by the empire. He was killed because the people in power did not like his challenge uh, and his call for justice for all people. And then the pre-Easter Jesus becomes the post-Easter resurrection. And for Marcus Borg, he says, you know, whether there was a body in the tomb or the, for the... Uh, reign or the kingdom or the realm of God to come on earth as it was in heaven. And Jesus believed that in his death and in his resurrection that God would bring creation to fullness and that he would become um, almost the new Torah, the new law and the new temple. And that in this time, um, purity laws which classified people as being good or bad or clean and unclean and what we would call restrictive table fellowship. In other words, if you were religious, there are certain people that you couldn't eat with because they would make you unclean. And he believed that all, all of that would end and in Jesus there would become the kingdom of peace and of justice. And then we decided, I told you, that we need to look at how various denominations um, picture Jesus because I think every religious denomination has its kind of favorite image of Jesus and I'm not one of these people that likes to dump on other uh, denominations or other images of Jesus because I think if you take them all and put them together and we learn from one another you get this amazing sense of the fullness of Christ. Can I have that next slide Deb? So we talked about the Protestant um, conservative Jesus or the Pentecostal Jesus, and we talked about the charismatic Jesus. And I told you that one of the things that I really love about the Pentecostal and charismatic tradition is that people experience worship in a very lively way. Like probably in a Pentecostal church, it wouldn't take me three times to evoke a high gym kind of response, right? And, and so it's good. I mean, silence is good and solemnity is good, but so is, is joy and excitement. And I think the gift of the Pentecostal and the charismatic tradition 
to the church has been the emphasis on um, um, personal commitment, that it is really important, however we make that commitment to God, that we, we do commit ourselves to being followers of Christ. As well, I think um, the Pentecostal and Charismatic tradition does stress the importance of remembering that as we go through death and as we move into the future, um, as we say in the United Church Creed, we are promised that God is with us through all of that journey. So God isn't just with us now, but God is with us in the future as well. And then I deviated a little bit because um, I wanted to uh, make sure that you understood the difference between the term evangelical and fundamentalist. All churches are evangelical. Evangelical simply means evangel, the good news, evangelism, sharing the good news. A person who is an evangelist is someone who, through what they do or what they say, shares the good news of God's love. That's very different than a fundamentalist. And a fundamentalist in any religion or any viewpoint is a dangerous thing. Fundamentalists do not dialogue well. They uh, tend to believe that their way is right above everyone else's. They often look back to an unrealistic um, past time. They believe that violence, uh, even killing people that are different than we are, is a way to attain what they believe is the kingdom of God. And so in our culture and in our world, we sometimes confuse the two words. Evangelism is a great word. Um, fundamentalism, in the sense that I'm talking about it, religious extreme fundamentalism that leads to violence and intolerance, uh, scapegoating of minorities, of course, is not a good thing. We spent a little bit of time talking about uh, um, atonement theology, and um, I'm going to have to dance around this one a little carefully, but one of the difficulties of um, an extreme focus on atonement theology means that people often get stuck on Good Friday. So if any of you saw that ghastly movie that Mel Gibson produced some years ago, which is, in my mind, kind of spiritual pornography and violent pornography. The problem with that movie, apart from how it, I think, is gratuitous violence, is that Mel Gibson never refers to anything before um, Good Friday. So he doesn't talk anything about Jesus' teachings. He doesn't talk anything about um, the birth stories, and he just barely hints at the resurrection, and it's like having your brain stuck on Good Friday. And if your brain is stuck on Good Friday, um, and you're misrepresenting, as I said last week, um, what atonement, at one meant means, um, atonement is, does not mean, and it's not biblical, to suggest that, you know, we sinned, and so God was so angry at us and was going to have to destroy us again, but Jesus stepped in, and he got killed, and God saw Jesus' blood being shed, and that was his son, but somehow that kind of assaged his divine wrath and his divine anger, and now we can go to heaven. I mean, that's a, a, a corruption and a misrepresentation of atonement theology in the Bible. You know, nowhere in the Bible does it suggest that Jesus died to convince God to love us. Rather, Jesus died to convince us about God's love for us. It's a subtle difference, but it's important. And we're going to extend that today just to look at three other images. So, yeah, Roman Catholic Jesus, Orthodox Jesus, and the liberal Protestant Jesus. And I said to you, it's a little bit like a diamond. You've got to have all the facets or faucets in a diamond. Facets, right? Because faucets is those things that you put water on. Okay. You have to have all the facets of a diamond. One of the things I love about the Roman Catholic tradition is its emphasis on 
the sacraments. So if you're a part of the Roman Catholic tradition, you go to church every Sunday and you celebrate the Mass. And big in the Roman Catholic Church is the reminder to connect the crucifixion to the resurrection. In other words, if you don't do that, and if you're stuck on Good Friday, there's no good news. I mean, what happened on Good Friday is not good news unless it's linked to the resurrection. When God raises Jesus from the dead. That's what God does. Jesus doesn't raise himself. And Roman Catholics make a strong link between the crucifixion and the resurrection. In other words, you can't have one without the other. And predominant in Catholic theology is this image of um, Jesus as uh, Christus Victor. So if you've ever seen any of those lovely drawings or paintings where Jesus kind of has a uh, magnific magnificent sense about him. He looks almost regal. He looks kind of like a, an emperor or a conquering king. It's the way, it's the uh, suggestion that if Good Friday was the victory of desperation, greed, and anxiety, and cynicism, then the resurrection is the victory over that and replacing that with grace and love and compassion. And that's a very strong um, image in Catholic theology. And of course, by celebrating the um, Eucharist or communion or whatever we call it, every Sunday, they're reminding us that the table is the central sacrament of the Christian faith. Like what Jesus left us was a meal. And he left us a meal where everyone is welcome. And that's why people eat so much in church. No, but it's true. It's true. Well, we all like food, but that's why we eat so much in church. Because we believe, based on the table, that kind of every meal is sacred. That's why we always say, you know how sometimes I'll say, well, you know, 75 people have uh, registered for this, and someone will say, well, there's no more room, and I say, well, no, no, no. There's always room, because there's always food. And I have not been at an event in 17 years here where we have run out of food. And that's a wonderful symbol for the abundance of God. Now, the Eastern Orthodox faith reminds us of another important part of Jesus' life that we don't pay much attention to in culture because it comes on December 25th and it ends. But if you know anything about Orthodox traditions, you know that uh, December 25th just begins the, is the beginning of Christmas and they have like the 12 days of Christmas. And Eastern Orthodox people love to celebrate the incarnation of Christ. So you see how we're creating this full picture. Crucifixion, resurrection, and now we go all the way back to the beginning, um, the incarnation of Christ, the birth of Christ, and those magnificent stories, whether they're totally accurately true or not, that talk about people's lives being changed by the gift of God made flesh in Jesus. And I read this week that in the uh, Eastern Orthodox Church, and this will be very interesting to our circle dancers, that uh, they have this thing called Peri Conaris. And it's called circle, it's made up of two words, Peri, which means circle, and Canassus, which means dancing. And so one, of, I see you smiling back there, Debbie. So one of the images they have of the Trinity is this large dance. And the whole world is kind of dancing in a circle with God and with the Holy Spirit. And when people in the circle start to step on each other's toes or don't know how to dance or maybe decide they want to elbow somebody out of the dance because they're not welcome, they talk about how Jesus came um, to join the dance and to teach human beings how to dance together again. And what a lovely image that is for justice 
and compassion and inclusion. And, you know, if you've ever been to a, a, a dance where they get beyond couples dancing, you'll know that eventually people start dancing together. And if it's a really um, uh, astute group, then they'll start to kind of go out onto the edges and bring in the people that are a little shy and maybe you don't know how to dance and teach them how to do it. And like what a lovely image for how the spirit infuses uh, the work of the church in the world. Now the next one would be the liberal Protestant Jesus. And I would say that that's the Jesus of the social gospel. And the gift of the liberal Protestant Jesus and the whole social gospel movement that originated in Western Canada and a lot of the work that the United Church has done and done through the centuries is that we try to always remember that between the birth of Jesus and the crucifixion of Jesus, he had this amazing life. And in this amazing life, he was attempting to teach people how to live. And he was attempting to teach people how to live, not to affirm necessarily all that we do as human beings, but in a way that is counter-cultural, counter-normal. I was reading this week a uh, reflection from somebody who was um, writing um, in our British Columbia uh, spiritual care network. They send out a, a weekly email to the different churches and the different ministers. And they said, you know, it may be, the, it may be in the end that all the church has to offer the world is a suggestion that the way that we live is irrelevant in comparison to the gospel and that the gospel way of living is the relevant way that may save the earth. And so when we talk about the life of Jesus, we talk about um, social justice, we talk about the Sermon on the Mount, we talk about loving our enemies, um, we talk about going the second mile. I, I don't know whether you know about that phrase, go the second mile. It was actually an anti-imperial, pro-justice um, activity that was created. Not necess I'm not sure whether it was created before Jesus died or after Jesus died, but um, if you lived under Roman oppression, the, the Roman army could ask you as a Jewish person to carry a soldier's backpack for one mile. Now, you can imagine that if you're an oppressed person and the oppressing army says, you know, here, take this soldier's backpack, carry it for a mile, and all the while you're carrying it and cursing underneath your breath, and the Roman soldier is gloating, saying, well, you know, there's another, you know, there's another nail in the coffin of oppression and Roman power, and then the mile is up, and the Roman soldier, of course, is expecting you just to dump that knapsack and swear at him and go on your way. And you say, hey, why don't I carry that for another mile? You kind of take the steam out of the oppressor. And so in that way of nonviolence, Jesus called uh, people to live. And so if you take these different uh, focuses on Jesus that we have, because... You know, one of the challenges in the United Church has been um, we have to also remember that we're not just a social justice movement, but we're also a church. Spiritual practice is important. Prayer is important. Just as you're beginning to see, and we've seen over the last number of years, in a number of evangelical churches in Canada, a very strong movement towards working for social justice. And I call that kind of a balancing. And so if we kind of take the best of these traditions, you see that we're picking up what the birth of Jesus meant, what the life of Jesus meant, what the death of Jesus meant, and what the resurrection of Jesus meant as kind of not an isolated act, but going all the way back to creation. The, the gift of Jesus is the continual theme through the whole Hebrew scripture of God making covenant with people, uh, of God calling normal human beings to live in relationship, uh, to work for justice, to trust in God's love. And we understand in the church that, that in some ways 
the person of Christ becomes the height of that covenantal love, and what flows from that is a continuation of that that is still active in the world through the Holy Spirit. Now, we had a lovely service on Friday that Pat put together, and a number of people helped, and we had um, people from different denominations, and I have to tell you, there was this lovely um, older woman, um, and, you know, people were saying, oh, I'm from the Mennonite Church, I'm from South Delta Baptist Church, I'm from such and such a church, and sometimes when you start to identify yourself by denominations, you kind of wonder, you know, what people think of each other, because, you know, denominational rivalry and denominational judgment all across the board sometimes happens, and she's, she's just kind of standing at the back there, and she starts stamping her feet, and she says, I'm from such and such a church, and you know what? I am just happy to worship God with anybody who calls himself a Christian. And she was just filled with uh, joy, and it was absolutely wonderful. And if you read the prayer of confession, you kind of heard how, you know, the prayer of confession wasn't just praying about my individual sins. It was praying about corporate sin, corporate injustice, how we're harming the earth, um, what unregulated mining and unregulated deforestation does in countries around the world. And it calls us to be cognizant as Christians that um, the Christian life is not just about my spirit. It's not just about my journey to the afterlife. It's about uh, that wonderful word, politics, right? What do you think about when you hear politics? Sorry? Value? Values, yep. See, corruption, yeah. Okay. Broken promises. Necessary evil. I think Owen knows where I'm going to go here. But you see, there's, such, there's partisan politics, but there's also this beautiful word, political, from the Greek word polis, city, which means the care of the city. So that's really what politics is about. And, and Jesus, in that sense, I mean, he wasn't from the NDP, he wasn't from the Liberal Party, he wasn't from the Conservative Party, the Republicans, or the Democrats. But he was political in that he cared about the community. So just in closing this off, um, I, I did a memorial service yesterday for Dan Kierkegaard, and the family had chosen uh, a lesson from John that I don't read very often at um, memorial services. So I did a little reading in the commentary, and it was interesting to know that the commentary said that um, while Matthew, Mark, and Luke talk a lot about um, the way that people should live, so they t the Sermon on the Mount and Jesus' various commands and commandments, John has this wonderful way of not focusing so much on that, but saying to his disciples that they used to consider themselves servants, or, yeah, servants. And then Jesus says, you know, I don't, I don't consider you servants anymore. I consider you friends. And then he said, as my friends, when, you, when I'm gone, I, I'm going to command you, interesting, I'm going to command you as friends to love one another. And as I was thinking about that, I thought, really, that's what church is supposed to be. That's why we talk so much sometimes about hospitality. That's why we talk so much about what happens if somebody just shows up here one day, nobody ever says anything to them. Nobody ever invites them to come in for coffee. No one ever 
asks about them? Or what happens if you are a member of the church and you're not here for a while? And no one looks around and says, I'll pick on you, John, because you were away last week. But, you know, Dr. J is not here today. You know, what, what's that about? Oh, well, maybe he was going lawyering or golfing or something like that. Or, but, you know, more often than not, sometimes when people are away, something's happened in their life. And so the cultivation of friendship, not just, hi, how are you, but relationships is critical to the mission of the church. Because somebody said to me last week, how come you make us talk to each other? <laughs> you know, the world is dying of loneliness. Do you know that loneliness was identified by the Vancouver Board of Trade as one of the four critical challenges facing Vancouver? Imagine that, eh? The British government actually appointed a, a minister for loneliness. And all around us in culture, people are beginning to form together into groups. Um, grandparents who are looking after grandchildren. Uh, children that are looking after aging parents. Um, one of the great gifts of the church is, this is one of the few places where... Uh, let's see, I can pick on somebody really old. Someone as old as Gwen... But listen, someone, someone in Gwen's age, bracket, as a senior, can connect with someone of Scott and Debbie's age, and then teenagers, Josh's age, children. It doesn't happen a lot, in, because many things in life are age-specific. So that is the incredible gift that... Um, the church brings. And that's why I continually encourage you to not just sit in a pew, but to connect and reach out with one another. That's a little bit of a side sermon, but anyway, that'll do for now. Let's take a few moments to sit in silence. <laughs> 